Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Tegan Clary, and I'm the Vice President of Marketing at Unchained Labs. I will be your moderator today, and I'm very glad you've decided to join us and take some time uh, to learn with us. Before we get the seminar started, I want to remind any of our customers joining us today that Unchained Labs is dedicated to supporting our customers through this challenging time. Please do not hesitate to get in touch with your local salesperson, application scientist, service engineer, or contact us directly at our website if there's anything you need. We're ready to help you and with anything that we can do. We will have a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. To ask questions, all you have to do is click on the Q&A in the Zoom navigation bar at the bottom or top of your screen and type your question. We will get to as many of those questions as we can today. And now I'd like to introduce our speaker, Chie Funadagawa, one of our outstanding application scientists. Today, Chie will take us through how UNCLE can be used to characterize and screen for the stability of adeno-associated viruses, or AAVs, um, that are being used in gene therapy and vaccine development. Some of you may have seen that we officially launched a new application for this area on UNCLE yesterday. Chie will also cover this announcement and will touch on the benefits of this fit for purpose application toolbox that is now available on all new UNCLE systems. And now I'll hand it over to Chie. Today, I will be giving an introduction to AAV and capsid stability screening using the UNCLE. But first, a quick overview on gene therapy. Gene therapy has been studied for decades now and can help stop or slow down the effects of disease on a genetic level using viral vectors. Viruses are made from assembled proteins encapsulating genetic information, which delivers that genetic information into a host or patient cell. Then the cell uses its natural ability to make proteins. There are several kinds of viruses or virus-like particles that have been used in gene therapy. Virus-like particles, or VLPs, have generally been used for viral vaccines. Lentiviruses deliver RNA where it needs to go and makes more permanent changes to the genome. Adeno-associated viruses, or AAVs, delivers DNA where it needs to go and makes less permanent changes. Our focus of the talk today will be on AAVs. AAVs have evolved as a promising technology for gene therapy due to their safety profile and high efficacy. AAV-based gene therapy holds great promise for treat treating many diseases, but before it can be used as treatment, there are a multitude of steps that need to be completed. As AAVs are being produced and purified, ideally they would only be the therapeutically relevant viruses with the genetic information enveloped in, in the assembled capsid. But the reality is that there can be a mixture of assembled viruses, empty capsids with no DNA, free-floating DNA, and unassembled capsid proteins. Therefore, it is important to characterize the AAVs through the whole development process to understand your product. What is the concentration of your viruses? How much of the assembled capsids and viruses are present? Do you have free-floating um, capsid proteins? What is the stability of the viruses or capsids? Are they already aggregated or do they have a tendency to aggregate? And what is the infectious titer and what is the efficacy? There are many questions that need to be answered during the development process and having answers to questions about the stability and whether the virus is aggregated is key to optimizing capsid design, formulations, process conditions, and storage conditions. Optimizing these will help to determine what conditions will allow for the product to remain stable and on the shelf for longer. You could also ask if stability problems are the underlying reason for potency, purity, or immunogenicity issues. Current techniques for answering these stability questions take time or are low throughput. Functional assays require highly skilled personnel working through a timely cell-based assay. 
as this um, field grows more and more, there really is a need for something to give you a stability answers in a much faster high throughput way. Additionally, many of the methods and techniques that we are using nowadays were not necessarily made for this specific purpose, and we don't have the right tool for the right job. This is where I would like to introduce you to the UNCLE platform from Unchained Labs. The UNCLE platform is an all-in-one biological stability platform which was built for biologics and could be an answer to many of the stability and aggregation questions that you may have. The UNCLE contains three different detection methods. It has fluorescence, static light scattering, or SLS, and dynamic light scattering, or DLS. The fluorescence gives you a full spectrum fluorescence between 250 nanometers and 720 nanometers. And the static light scattering um, gives you the aggregation information um, as you are collecting the fluorescence data and it collects that at the same time. The dynamic light scattering or DLS gives you information about the sizing and polydispersity of those samples. Additionally, the uncle has the capability to temperature control, which can be user defined between 15 degrees and 95 degrees Celsius. The sample holder for the uncle is called the uni. The uni contains 16 microcuvettes, which each hold nine microliters of sample per well. The spacing between the wells are the same as a 384 well plate, so you can use a multi-channel pipetter uh, if you would like to, to load the samples. Once the samples are loaded into the unis, then it is uh, clamped in between the blue frames which have the silicone seals. Once it is completely closed inside of the blue frames, um, it, is, it is completely sealed, and so it minimizes uh, any kind of evaporation that may happen as you thermal ramp or heat the samples. And additionally, as you're working with infectious uh, material or viruses, it also does not touch the actual instrument, so minimizes any kind of exposure. You can load up to three unis um, into the instrument, which allows you to run up to 48 samples at a time. You do not have to run all 48 samples. You can run as little as one sample at a time and as many as 48. Because of the three detection methods that are inside of the uncle, there are many different applications that can be run in this one instrument. TMTAG with DLS is our most popular application, and I will be going into this into more detail during this talk. However, essentially what it looks at is the unfolding temperature as you thermal ramp the samples, TMs. Also, it looks at the aggregation temperature um, or the onset of aggregation, which is TAG. Additionally, it looks at the dynamic light scattering information at the initial temperature and the final temperature. B22KD and G22 are also different applications that can be run on the uncle and looks at this protein at, this, at different concentrations at the same temperature, uh, usually at ambient temperature. And this looks at colloidal stability. Essentially, this acts as a uh, aggregation predictor for your samples. Do they have a tendency to aggregate over time? The isothermal stability measurement essentially is set the temperature set um, by the user and you're looking at the change over time. TM with Cipro um, is essentially a classic DSF measurement where you can use an extrinsic dye because we're collecting that full emission spectrum between 250 and 720 nanometers. Um, Cipro orange is um, used because it binds to hydrophobic pockets of the protein and non-specifically binds to those pockets. Viscosity can also be measured using the DLS optics. Sizing with thermal ramp is also uh, something it, that can be measured using the DLS optics and essentially does a thermal ramp and collects DLS information instead of the fluorescence. Um, this can be used to look at dramatic size changes that are occurring as you heat the samples. Thermal recovery essentially heats the samples to a certain temperature and brings them back down again and looks at that refolding process and how many times it's able to cycle through that. Delta G is looking at a different kind of stability where instead of thermal ramping the stabilities, you're adding chemical denaturants to the sample to see how stable it is and so essentially looking at the chemical stability. For all fluorescence measurements on the uncle, you get this full emission spectrum. There are two lasers um, which are used during this time. There's a 266 nanometer and a 473 nanometer laser. For the TMTAG DLS application, we're looking at the intrinsic fluorescence, which is the natural fluorescence of the proteins due to the aromatic groups. 
specifically more so the tryptophan because it dominates the fluorescent signal. This is excited by the 266 nanometer laser and as the samples unfold, the, the tryptophans or the aromatic groups go from a more hydrophobic environment as it's, as it's uh, folded and then as it's, as it's heated, it becomes more exposed to a hydrophilic environment. When that happens, the fluorescence signal also shifts, and in this case, you can see a clear shift of the fluorescence peak um, shifting, to, shifting towards a higher wavelength. We call that a redshift. In addition to that, you get the information from the 266 and 473 nanometer lasers and looking at the pure scattering of those lasers. That is our SLS measurements. As the samples are heated, if they do aggregate, you will see an increase in those peaks as the samples aggregate because it scatters more light. This is measured for every temperature that is measured in the instrument during this application. During the TM and TAG DLS application, you get eight data points in one experiment, and again with just nine microliters of sample per well. From the full spectrum fluorescence, you get the TM. From the unfolding behavior, you essentially get the inflection points in which the, there's change in that fluorescence signal. The TM is the inflection point, and the T onset is when there is change or starts to occur in that fluorescence signal. Additionally, you get the static light scattering, essentially aggregation information at two wavelengths, 266 nanometer and 473 nanometers. The 266, because it's a shorter wavelength, is more sensitive to lower concentrations and smaller aggregates, and 473 for higher concentrations and larger aggregates. From there, you get the aggregation onset temperatures for, um, for the, from those two signals. Additionally, you get the dynamic light scattering information at the initial temperature and the final temperature. What that gives you is the polydispersity information. So are your samples monodispersed? Are there different size particles present? Then it would be polydispersed. At the initial temperature, the advantage of having this is that it essentially serves as a quality check of the samples, of those exact samples actually, and that you're about to thermal ramp. Additionally, you get the sizing information to see what is the diameter or hydrodynamic diameter of those samples and are they already aggregated. This application on the uncle can be directly used to look at the capsid stability and aggregation information. With the DLS optics inside of the uncle, you can look at the AAV size, polydispersity, and aggregation. The DLS confirms whether your samples are in good shape to begin with or if there are already some aggregates that could be present. Using the TM, TAG, and DLS application, the DLS is measured at the initial temperature and the final temperature. So in this uh, figure, you can see it's measured at 25 degrees Celsius and at 80 degrees Celsius. In this application, we are looking at the intrinsic fluorescence, or the natural fluorescence, of the capsid proteins. As the samples are heated, it's going to disrupt and change the uh, environment around the aromatic groups of those capsid proteins, and essentially show a change in the fluorescence signal. This is an example of the full emission spectrum of an AAV sample using the TMTAG DLS application. With the intrinsic fluorescence measurements, the 266 nanometer laser is used to excite uh, the aromatic groups, and the fluorescence shows up between 300 and 400 nanometer lasers. That is the re region that is used to monitor the fluorescence. Additionally, the uh, 266 nanometer laser and the 473 nanometer laser is also monitors to, monitored to look at when aggregation occurs as you heat up the samples. This is a protein unfolding curve of AAV9 using intrinsic fluorescence. As you can see, there is a um, TM around 78.6 degrees Celsius, which is the inflection point in which when the curve changes. Additionally, you can see the T onset, so when there is an onset in the change in that fluorescence curve around 74.2 degrees Celsius. The advantage of the uncle is really being able to have that aggregation information measured at the same time and being able to overlay that at the same time. The aggregation information shown with the TAG from the SLS 266 um, occurs at 74.5 degrees Celsius, which um, is at the same time as the T onset. 
Using this one application, you can get information about the aggregation and unfolding of the samples at the same time with just those nine, nine microliters of sample. Because the uncle can measure up to 48 samples at a time, you can measure various different conditions or different serotypes at the same time in the same experiment. This is showing an example of three different serotypes that were run at the same time, and you can see clearly that there are different TMs. In this specific case, AAV2 appears to be the least thermally stable, and AAV1 is the most thermally stable. Additionally, the table below is showing a comparison of the intrinsic fluorescence measurements that were done through the uncle with other classic DSF measurements using Cipro Orange. The advantage of using the uncle is that because Cipro Orange binds non-specifically to any um, hydrophobic pockets, once you change different formulations and you look at different formulation studies and perhaps you use more hydrophobic formulations, it could become a problem with Cipro Orange. However, because the uncle is looking at the natural fluorescence of the protein and there is no need to add a dye, it's always going to just look at that natural fluorescence of the aromatic groups. Again, because of the uncle's ability to run up to 48 samples at a time per experiment, you could run that many formulations, various serotypes, different constructs, all in one experiment under three hours. I just introduced to you how the UNCLE's TMTAG DLS application can help assess the thermal stability of capsids. As the samples are heated, and as the capsids were heated, essentially they disrupt and change the local environment around the aromatic groups, and therefore changing the intrinsic fluorescence signals. But the UNCLE can actually do even more. Because the uncle is measuring that full emission spectrum between 250 and 720 nanometers, with the addition, addition of an extrinsic dye such as CyberGold, we can actually see when the DNA or the nucleic acids are being ejected. CyberGold binds specifically to uh, such information. CyberGold, before it binds to DNA, has a lower fluorescence, and as the DNA binds, it has a higher fluorescence. So as the genome is ejected out of the capsids, it will bind to the CyberGold, therefore showing a larger fluorescence signal. This could therefore answer the question whether the capsid disruption is occurring at the same time as when the genome is ejected, or does the genome eject out of the capsid at a lower temperature, therefore is it less stable in that sense. Once the genome is ejected out of the AAVs, it is therapeutically uh, inactive at that point. This is an example of the full emission spectrum of AAV9 with CyberGold. For CyberGold, the 473 nanometer laser is used to excite the dye, and the uh, fluorescence analysis is performed between 500 and 650 nanometers. The curve here shows the change in the fluorescence signal with temperature of AAV9. The multiple curves are showing the replicates that were run together, and the average TM appeared to be at 58.1 degrees Celsius. From this, we can see that the TM of the genome ejection is indeed significantly lower than when the capsid disruption was ob observed in the previous experiment. Again, the advantage of the uncle is being able to collect that static light scattering information at the same time. When we overlay the SLS collected uh, at 473 nanometers, you can see that the aggregation onset temperature is at 75.2 degrees Celsius, which is similar to what we observed using the first experiment using the intrinsic fluorescence. There appears to be a clear difference between when the genome is ejected outside of the capsid and when the capsid itself disrupts and starts to aggregate. Again, uh, using the uncle, you can run up to 48 samples at a time, so very easily you can compare different serotypes. This is an example comparing serotype AAV2 and AAV9. In both cases, the TM in which the genome is ejected appears to be significantly lower than what we observed in the previous experiment looking at the intrinsic fluorescence. And in both cases, once again, the aggregation onset appears to be occurring above 60 degrees Celsius. Using just one instrument, the uncle is able to give you answers to two types of stability questions. The capsid disruption, when, is, when does the capsid actually unfold and break apart? In addition to that, when is the genome ejected outside of the capsid and therefore becomes therapeutically uh, inactive? 
In these studies, there was a clear difference in the TMs uh, when the capsid was disrupted and when the genome was ejected. The genome ejection appears to occur at a much lower temperature than when the capsid is disrupted. The power of the uncle really is orthogonal data, and you can get answers to both types of stability uh, questions that you may have about your capsids or AAVs using this one instrument. The two methods in which DNA could be released, genome ejection and capsid disruption, was previously suggested using other methods. And the clear differences between the genome ejection uh, TM and the capsid disruption TM was able to me be measured using just this one instrument. The power of the uncle really is orthogonal data. So using the dynamic light scattering uh, optics that are also inside of the uncle, you can do a thermal ramp using the DLS and see when you see a dramatic change in the size as you heat up the samples. In this case, you can see a size starting to change around 55 degrees and then a dramatic change in the size around 75 degrees Celsius, which coincides with the capsid disruption temperature. Having orthogonal data really provides more confidence in the decisions and what you're seeing. The uncle can be used for viral characterization at different steps in the development process. After purification of the samples, DLS can be used to check the quality of the samples. Do you have a lot of unassembled capsid proteins or do you have mostly assembled capsids? Additionally, you can gain information about whether the, whether the samples are already aggregated or not. In addition to that, the uncle can also provide information about the stability of the samples in two different ways. It can give you information about the capsid stability, when does the capsid disrupt, and also when does the genome get ejected out of the capsid, so the genome ejection stability. In addition to that, we also get information about the TAG, the aggregation onset temperature, as we're heat stressing these samples. This complete picture of stability can be collected for 48 samples with just nine microliters of sample at a time or per well using one instrument. And because of the different detection methods of the uncle, it can provide a more complete picture of the stability of your viruses and capsids. This can help optimize and screen capsid design, formulations, and process conditions much faster. We are excited to announce a new application that will be released on new uncles that will make this process to determine capsid stability even easier. This viral toolbox application will be released on all new uncles starting April. This application is designed to make viral stability measurements easier. There are also many new added features such as particle intensity. The uncle will measure DLS particle intensity to further help with the assessment of whether you have assembled capsids and viruses by correlating the particle intensity measured with concentration of the samples. With the new capsid stability and DLS application, CyberGold is first added into the sample. Then the initial free DNA is determined by measuring the initial fluorescence with the dye present. If there is a lot of free floating DNA already present in the sample, then there will be a higher fluorescence signal of this cyber gold compared to other samples. Then the initial DLS um, is measured at the initial temperature. This will measure the sizing and polydispersity and act essentially as a quality check to see if the samples are already aggregated, and to determine the size of those samples also. That DLS information is then used to determine the particle intensity. This can correlate to particle titer. This essentially can serve as an additional quality check of those samples before we're about to thermal ramp those samples. The next step is to heat those samples and thermal ramp them and to determine the TMs and the TAGs. The TM in this case is the genome ejection temperature and the TAG at 473 nanometers is the aggregation onset temperature in which those samples start to aggregate. And then at the final temperature, the DLS is measured once again to determine the sizing and polydispersity at that final temperature. After the DLS is measured, then the temperature is then lowered back to the initial temperature to determine the final DNA fluorescence signal. 
by comparing the initial uh, fluorescent signal and the final fluorescent signal, you can see if there's a huge difference and whether there was a more DNA released um, or less DNA released in different wells in different samples in similar conditions. You can determine all of this in one experiment with just nine microliters of sample per well, and you can run up to 48 different samples at a time. If you would like to learn more about the Capsid Stability application, the Uncle, or any of the products from Untain Labs, please reach out to info at untainlabs.com or to me, Chie Funatogawa at untainlabs.com. Also, please check out some of our upcoming webinars and other events. All of these events can be found under the events section at untainlabs.com. Thank you, Chie, for that excellent introduction um, to how UNCLE can be used to assess and to screen for AAV stability. We do have some great questions that have already been submitted. Um, you can still ask a question by entering it into the Q&A section in the Zoom navigation bar. So Chie, let's dive into the first question. Um, how long do the TM, TAG, DLS experiments for AAVs typically take? That's a great question. Um, so for the thermal ramping portion, um, because the ramp rate can be user defined, um, it varies a little bit. But for example, if you were to do a one degree C per minute ramp rate in this type of experiment, it would take about an hour and a half. Um, if you, of course, did um, 0.5 degrees C per minute type ramp rate, then it would take about three hours or so. Okay, um, another question for you here, Chie. So, um, the question is, I've seen DNA release that was not detected because it has degraded an AAV aggregation that was not detected because the aggregates are too large for DLS. How would you handle this type of situation? Um, sure. So it would be a little bit dependent on the situation. So um, honestly, it would have to, we'd have to see if Cybergold is able to bind um, to that degraded DNA or not. Um, if not, then the uncle does have other options. Um, for example, um, if the capsid is uh, assembled, then we could see the capsid disruption using the first TMTAG DLS um, method. So you could see that portion of it and see when the natural fluorescence um, changes. Um, and then for the SLS portion, you could also see the aggregates of and see essentially when the aggregations form or when they start to increase as you heat up the temperatures. We do have two lasers in the uncle, the 266 and 473 nanometer laser. And the reason for the 473 nanometer laser is, is that it's better and more sensitive to larger aggregates and at higher concentrations just by the nature of the larger wavelength. Okay, and another question for you here. Um, this one is about, um, uh, the uncle being used in a QC setting. Can, can the uncle be used in QC and is it validatable? Yes, so um, the uncle does with, an, with a purchase of an additional license. Um, it is 21 CFR part 11 compliant. Okay, another, another question um, is a little bit different here. So on the concentration of AAVs, um, in these applications, Chie, roughly what AAV concentrations can be used? I'm sure. So what's been um, tested so far is on the lower end, I would say 510 to the 11th v, uh, VG per ml um, is on the lower end. On the upper end, what we've run is, um, I would say, 110 to the 14th VGs per ml. But the upper limit really is more so um, the like as long as it doesn't saturate the detectors, you can go, uh, I would imagine you could go higher too. We just haven't measured higher than that at this point. Okay, um, what, what kind of sample preparation is required for these applications, Chia? Sure, that's a great question. Um, so for the TMTAG DLS application portion that I talked about today, um, that actually doesn't require any kind of sample preparation other than just loading it into the sample holders because we're just looking at the natural fluorescence of the uh, capsid proteins themselves. For the cyber gold assay where we were looking at that genome ejection portion, then you do um, have to add the cyber gold before you load them into the unis. Um, okay, um, so another another question just on comparison to maybe some other tools. So um, similar assays can be done on qPCR systems. 
um, with other dyes. How how is Uncle different and um, or or better than some of those techniques, Gia? Sure. So the one advantage for just directly measuring the cyber gold assay is um, getting that. Um, aggregation information at the same time. So not only are you going to get information about when the DNA is ejected, but you will also get information about when um, you see aggregation of those particles. In addition, uh, with this new capsid stability application, you're going to get a lot more information. So a wealth of information about the quality of your particles using the DLS uh, portion. Um, so there's just a lot more information that you can get um, in that way using this application. Okay, great. Um, I'm going to answer a question for you, Chie. There's um, a few questions, quite a few, uh, regarding this uh, viral toolbox for AABs being available, whether it's available on older uncle systems or newer uncle system. Um, as we've as we've developed this application, um, we we learned a couple things. One, our uh, spectrometer and our instrument um, actually required us to move to uh, basically a newer spectrometer. Um, it, it means we validated all previous uncle applications to look at uh, similarity and they're all similar. But for the, um, this particular application, we're, we've actually had to make a decision to, to go forward with it being only on new uncle systems that are sold after April 1st to customers. Um, software updates for um, other things that we've improved in the uncle systems um, will be made available to everyone, but this application is available on um, only on new uncle systems after April 1st. However, if this is something that you really want to do and get into, um, if you are one of our current uncle owners, get in touch with us. We have a variety of ways for people to uh, do trade-ins, upgrades, and, and things like that. So please get in touch with us. Talk to us about um, the path forward on um, this application area, if it's something you're interested in. But it is uh, changes to software and also hardware that um, made it such that we have to go have it be on go forward uncles as of April 1st. So I see at least three, four or five questions in here and I, I, I wanted to make sure that that was addressed. Okay. Uh, back to some of the technical questions here. Um, so Chia, another one, can you determine whether an AAV sample contains a higher percentage of empty to full capsids uh, or based on the TM values that you see? Um, so it wouldn't directly measure it in that way. Um, what you could do is look at, so with the new capsid stability application, because we measure the initial fluorescence using cyber gold and then the final fluorescence um, using cyber gold. If you have samples that have um, more empty capsids, let's say, then when you look at that comparison of the initial fluorescence and final fluorescence, you would see a smaller difference there. Um, of course, you would wanna do that comparison with similar cyber gold concentrations and, um, of course, similar um, AAV con concentrations. Okay, um, a, a bit of a similar question here. Um, is, is the concentration currently only measured in VG titer, um, or is it possible for this method to detect full versus empty captives, basically the ratio? The full, full versus empty capsids. I think the question just is the concentration, right, uh, mm -hmm. is uh, measured in VG titer. The question is, can it can it detect the ratio between full and empty capsids? Oh, I see. So um, the actual uncle measurements themselves are just pure fluorescence measurements. So um, it you could always do that ratio by looking at the fluorescence signal. I'm not sure if that answered the question. I, I think it, I think it's good. Okay. I, I mean, ultimately, Chie, we as we know that the this application really is focused on kind of the overall titer, right? And then the ability to see the leakage and provide a TM value based on the leakage from the capsids. So uh, I think right as of right now, it is it is not necessarily measuring the exact ratio, right, of an empty yeah, that is correct. Yeah. Okay, Chia, here's another one. Um, just a general question for you about the uncle uh, regarding the temperature range. What's the temperature range that the instrument can heat the samples and what's the heating rate on the uncle? Sure, so the temperature range for the uncle is anywhere between 15 to 95 degrees Celsius. And the ramp rate that you can heat the samples, again, is user defined anywhere between 0.1 degrees C per minute to even as fast as 10 degrees C per minute, depending on what you would like to define. 
Okay. Um, a couple other, just I think, general questions about Uncle. You, you, I think you sh uh, represented early in your presentation about delta G curves. Mm -hmm. um, the question here is, can you elaborate on the delta G curve and which element of the assay screening is commonly coupled with on the Uncle? So I think it's just a general question of um, how are we how are we getting delta G values on Uncle? Sure. Um, so the delta G is measured through chemical denaturation. So it's a chemical denaturation curve. So we are using su um, such as urea or guanidine to unfold the proteins instead of heat. The advantage of having this is that there may be times where you have very similar TMs and you can't really decide just based on the thermal stability if there's a clear difference. In that case, you can move that forward and then uh, look at the chemical stability, for example, because there are cases where the thermal stability may be similar, but the chemical stability is not. Specifically, what it's going to be looking at is um, it's going to be looking at the intrinsic fluorescence also, so the first aspect of it, where it would look at the natural fluorescence of the protein and um, at what different concentrations of chemical denaturants, how it will unfold and when it will unfold. Um, that's great. Thanks, Chie. So similar assays, I think we, we did cover this, but I want to uh, just um, ask one more question about it. Sure. Um, how do you distinguish between um, Cipro binding to DNA that's ejected or aggregated protein? How do you, how are we distinguishing the, the difference? Um, the Cipro or, um, so the Cipro orange binds specifically to uh, hydrophobic groups. So in the assays that we're, be, we're using is going to be cyber gold that will bind specifically to uh, DNA. So for the genome ejection portion, uh, we want to use cyber gold because that's specific to nucleic acids. Right. Okay, Chie, another question for you here. The, um, I think you, you already covered the concentration range. Um, there's a couple of questions here about um, the difference between, um, and I may help you with this one, which is just the difference between the measurements that Uncle's providing and analytical ultracentrifugation or SDS page or chromatography methods. Um, how would you describe the information that Uncle's providing in comparison to those? Um, sure. So, uh, Tegan, feel free to jump in and add more to uh, what yep. I have to say. Um, but I would say one main key thing is really the um, that thermal stability of the different samples and being able to screen, um, you know, up to forty eight samples of that to look at when. Um, when it's unfolding and which ones are more thermally stable, in addition to getting that aggregation information when um, it starts to aggregate with heat. And so it's more of a structural stability, I would say, um, when we're talking about a lot of this heat ramping, in addition to the cyber gold aspect, um, which is looking at when that genome is ejected um, as you heat up the samples and as the structure is being compromised. Great, yeah, just, just to add to that for everyone, um, I think those, the ultra centrifugation technique along with um, SDS page, um, HPLC methods, right? I think what, what many, many of you are trying to do or what people are trying to do is, uh, is to get that differentiation between um, capsids that are empty, capsids that are full and intermediates. Um, I think what the real advantage here on Uncle is, is to look at the actual stability of, of these um, different AAVs in comparison to each other. And then also in comparison to the conditions that, that they're in for formulation or for storage conditions and such. Um, and really to be able to determine is one AAV um, better than another or is the, a, a condition that we're storing it in better than another, right? So it's really about, as Chia just said, the stability of these complex molecules and whether they're actually uh, going to remain stable, right, in different conditions as they try to get to, um, basically get to their target, right, to deliver their, their DNA payload. Um, one other thing I just want to mention, I, I think I may have misspoke, which is on um, this, the, this difference between Cipro and Cyber, okay, um, and GA has, has made it clear that it's cy Cyber Gold is really the dye that we are um, recommending that people use with this application, right? It, it binds specifically to nucleic acids, especially when they've leaked out of, of these molecules. Um, you can do assays as well, where you can determine whether there's free DNA already in the sample. Um, I think there are a couple questions on that as well. So you can 
um, do the assays where you can d look for and detect whether there there already is leakage. Um, and then with the, the DLS, of course, you're not gonna see that DNA, but you can also see some of the structural information, right, about these um, AAV capsids themselves. So I just wanted to make sure that that's really clear for, for everyone. Um, Chia, a couple more questions for you, and then um, we'll we'll wrap up the, the seminar. Um, can can Uncle or in, can in process samples be run with a bit more complex matrix matrices than formulation buffers, like from different parts of maybe the manufacturing process? Um, sure. So um, for the cyber gold portion of the capsid stability application, as long as there are no other nucleic acid type um, things that may bind to cyber gold, um, you could always run a clean sample. Even if there is, it will bind. Um, you would just expect a higher fluorescent signal initially, and then you would see as you heat it an increase in that, again, assuming that the AAVs are the only uh, samples that are released seeing um, more nucleic acid information. So um, that can absolutely be used. For the DLS portion, depending on the purity, of course, you um, may get more aggregates or um, a more polydispersed sample that may show uh, for that portion, but that would be um, expected. Okay, okay. Um, Chi, I wanna address one qu a couple of questions that are in here um, as well. So there are some questions about comparisons uh, to qPCR method method uh, methods, and um, we you know we we have seen that there um, it, you know, I think there is there is good correlation to the qPCR methods, but qPCR um, is going to be more specifically on just doing the quantitation right of the free DNA. And I just want to make it crystal clear here what what I think we're we're bringing to this area of research. Um, it it really is about um, the ability to look at the thermal stability of these um, these capsids and the D and to see um, under stress, specifically thermal stress, um, which ones or which conditions right uh, are are making sure that the DNA payload is staying inside of the capsid. Right, we're we're not really doing what I would call an endpoint assay, which is how much DNA is free in the, in the solution. This is really about assessing the stability. Okay, and I just want to make sure that that's clear for everybody that it's not necessarily um, just uh, uh, looking at a, a quantitative amount of the DNA. Okay. Um, Chie, maybe um, one more question for you here. So, um, what is the resolution limit on sizing, and how do different particle sizes need to be resolved using using this application area, Nuncle? Sure. So um, I think this is specifically uh, talking about the DLS portion. So the diameter range that the DLS um, on the uncle can detect is between 0 0.3 to 1,000 nanometers in size. Um, anything in DLS just by nature, if you have anything that is um, similar in size, they show up as the same peak, but a wider peak, essentially, but it will still show as a polydispersed sample. And for them to show up as separate peaks, then um, you want to make sure that they're like three times in size or so um, for them to show up in that way to resolve them. Okay. Great, Chi. Thank you for that. Um, I want to thank everybody for all the great questions we've had today. Uh, and GA for uh, your great presentation and introduction to these applications on the uncle system. Um, I do want to remind everybody we will have a, another uh, webinar on this. It's a CHI webinar. Uh, it's titled Catch Your Capsid Leaks, um, Uncle's Tools for AAV Stability and Application. It's on April 23rd. So if you're interested in joining that, you can hear a, a, a bit more about the, the um, specifics of the new application and, and the software as well. Um, I want to thank you all for have joined us today live. Uh, I think with many of us working remotely or working from home these days, it's a great time to learn and explore new solutions to problems that we may have. Um, if you'd like to have a deeper conversation with our team about UNCLE and how it can fit into your work, especially if you're doing this kind of work with AABs, please do get in touch with us. Um, our team would love to connect you over a Zoom meeting just like this. Uh, we all have Zoom and we're all happy to have these, these um, conversations and meetings with um, any of you that are interested. Uh, I want to thank you again for attending our virtual seminar and I hope that you have an excellent rest of your day.